Welcome to Marine Tech Talk, a podcast about how Teledyne Marine's innovative technologies are enabling scientific discoveries and commercial tasks in the world's oceans and waterways. In this episode of Marine Tech Talk, discover how one man is trying to make a difference using Teledyne technology to reduce harmful interactions between humans and marine life. Learn about line-free, ropeless fishing technology that allows fishers to fish, and whales and other mammals to live without the danger of entanglement. Hear how Richard Riles and his organization Smelts, the Sea Mammal Education Learning Technology Society, are trying to make a difference. And welcome to Teledyne Marines, Marine Tech Talk. And today we have as our guest, Captain Richard Riles. And I'm really excited to chat with Richard because he was actually the very first episode of Marine Tech Talk. Melissa chatted with him a couple of years ago, and he's the founder and CEO of SMELTS, S-M-E-L-T-S. And SMELTS stands for Sea Mammal Education Learning Technology Society. And it's a solution-based organization that designs and builds tools and technology to reduce the negative impact that we have on marine life. And they've developed a really cool product, a line-free ropeless lift bag fishing technology system for um, bottom set fisheries. And it basically allows fishermen to fish and whales to live without worrying about being in, entangled. So it's a really amazing product. And obviously, um, the impact for something like this is just astounding. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to talk to Richard today. And, and Richard, why don't we just, um, I know you had the first episode and you guys talked a little bit about the technology and, and what you're doing. And I kind of want to catch up with you um, on this episode, but why don't you just give us a little brief overview of your ropeless fishing technology and how it works because you use Teledyne modems. And I think that's really cool that Teledyne's involved in this as well. So could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So in, in the very beginning, when I started looking at this entanglement problem, I, I started studying a lot of different ways to see if we could remove the persistent vertical line out of the, the water column for fisheries and, and have a reliable, pragmatic, um, responsible way of doing this for the fisheries. And I, I was studying mitigated rope tools, rope in a box, rope in a bag, rope on a spool. And and I just realized that it wasn't going to fulfill my engineering needs because I was trying to address a few other things, marine debris, trying to reduce marine debris. And we were also trying to prevent ghost fishing. We wanted to see if we could build a technology that would actually maybe get the gear back at a higher rate for the fishermen. Um, So I've been playing with high pressure gas for a big part of my career. And, and I realized that if we managed high pressure air at the bottom of the ocean and filled a lift bag, there would probably be no fisheries that we wouldn't be able to get off the bottom. So I started building prototypes. And at the very beginning, I was spending all my own money and trying to you know build these prototypes and test them. And, and we were seeing uh, with a few of my colleagues that the, the This was working. Um, We were setting scuba tanks with basically a control vessel that have a battery and a valve in it. And at the time, we had no acoustics um, and we were using timers and we would we'd set a timer, say five o'clock. And and that timer would open that valve and it would fill that lift bag and whatever was connected to that lift bag. And that system would come to the surface. And and I just I did it like a thousand times. And I realized that this is, this is a reliable way of doing this. And then when I applied for my patent and we won the patent after almost four and a half years of the patent agency looking and realizing that there was no prior art for this. That's when I realized that we had invented a new machine and it's a lifting engine that is used for the ocean. So we started realizing that not only can we lift you know, marine debris, boats, fishing gear, scientific equipment, it it allowed us to expand the idea of using acoustics. Um, And I knew in the very beginning to try to build a technology for fisheries, 
we had better have a, a really high success rate at, right at the beginning. And that that is what brought me to Teledyne. I, I knew Teledyne was a world leader in acoustic technology. And we wanted to take it from uh, a simple timer technology to an on-demand type technology where the fishermen could call the gear up when they needed it or wanted it. And that was the beginning of um, working with Teledyne and using compact modems, the, the very similar to what a phone has, except for it being radio technology on the surface. It is acoustic technology for subsea application. And we, we began building a few prototypes and finding a lot of success in this acoustic communication and being able to control the, the lobster raft, which is what we call it in New England for the lobster fishery, and, and having very reliable recovery rates in the high 90s, 98%. Wow. Um, and really, the, most of the failures we were learning were actually human failures, um, not turning on the air tank, um, not dunking the transducer, letting the batteries die, very similar things to, um, you know, just letting your radio play in your car all night and go out and be like, well, is it the car broken or was it the human that forgot to turn the key off? So we learned a lot about that in the very beginning. And and then we just continued pushing further and further. And over the last two years, since the last Tech Talk, we have helped Teledyne um, basically break in their new ultra compact modem. So we're basically in a lot of trials with this new technology. It's a smaller board. It's more powerful. It's having really great communication. And then this, this year, we added a pressure transducer as well to the modem. So now when the gear is sitting on the sea floor, the, the, the gear knows what ocean pressure is it, it has. So we know the elevation of the gear. And what we're trying to do here is we're trying to make it be a one button function for the fishermen. So the gear actually becomes smart and it, it, it opens the valve for as long as it needs to, to fill the lift bag. So that's been a huge new development that we've been working on together with Teledyne. And uh, it's been very exciting. The first units are just getting out into fisheries now. Well, it's amazing. That's, it's brilliant, really. And, you know, as a diver, I completely understand how lift bags work. And, you know, when you think about it, it's just such cool technology. And, you know, um, I know that there's been challenges in the past, too, with that you know, in, in this, you know, this, this hasn't been an easy road with this, um, this technology either, because, you know, they kind of have, you, you know, you have to know, and that's where the acoustic modems come in, you have to know where the gear is, if you're using ropeless gear, and you don't have the buoy at the top, to identify where it is, you got to figure out where it is, you've got to figure out um, a whole lot of things. And so, um, you know, having that communication and using the Teledyne modems and now, you know, the new, even you know, now it sounds like you guys are a little bit even more ahead of the game with, you know, the new stuff that you're doing. Um, so could you talk a little bit about, you know, how you've overcome those challenges using the technology and how, how you've honed it a little bit? I know you just mentioned, you know, that you've, what you've added to, um, to the product, but also like, you know, how is, how's it going on the challenge side of things? It's not been an easy road, has it? No, I, I, building any new technology has a huge amount of challenges. For one, it's very expensive. Acoustics have always generally been used in military operations, uh, oil and gas, very scientific based I industries. And, and the boards are made almost hand, almost hand built. So they're not they're not being produced in very high numbers. So trying to overcome some of the very high expense and, and get these prototypes built and, and, and get the funding to even see if it's even possible. Is this, is this technology even a viable solution for this? And over time, yes, could we bring the prices down and stuff like that? But really in the beginning was, can, can this even work? And that was a huge amount of effort from us to try to build some systems and get some reliable fishermen that knew that this stuff might not work and be be honest with us and the assessment and what we could do to make it better. And now my partner fisherman, I, I tell him all the time, I'm like, you should make this look a lot harder. Um, you really have showed <laughs> us that this is possible. But it's it's been many years of 
trial and error. And, and really for us, we're very much field engineers. So we're out on the boats. We're with the fishermen. We're in fisheries. We're working with the feds and, and working with Teledyne. I've had Teledyne on the boats many times. And, and the development and the collaboration between all the stakeholders is really what's making the difference. The, the, the novel idea I came up with, it's definitely a, it's a good one. But it's really been the partnerships between all the groups that are really looking like it's going to make a true solution for the for the fisheries and industry. And uh, as we continue to push that and push that development, the the understanding of how to make the gear cheaper and and maybe even more reliable and being able to pump out more acoustic boards. Um, the, the the pandemic has been a huge challenge to the world. And many facets of supply and industry and engineering, um, things that were very normal to, to get and very simple to get have become incredibly challenging to get. So we, we've been trying to evolve and deal with pre-pandemic, post-pandemic are two different times in our world. And we're trying to adapt to that. And already fisheries are dealing with so much pressure that, you know, we're trying to, you know, we don't want to dump a huge burden on them. And that's why since day one, smelts is, we're a non-profit for a, a very important reason. And that is to, to be able to get some funding, to build this technology, to give it to the fishermen, to see if it's even viable. And that's, that's, that's been four years of my life, ultimately eight from when I first started. But now that we've been able to get gear built and into fisheries, we're learning a ton and we're learning what we can do better. We're learning more about how we have to mark this technology because as you mentioned, once you remove that vertical line and buoy, the buoy has always traditionally been what, what other ocean users, including other fishermen use to, to not overset or overlay or, or negatively interact with other fishing gear. So that, that is a very complex thing to try to do to remove something out of space and time and replace it either with a data point or what we're trying to do is we're trying to work on subsea location technology using acoustics, using passive reflectors and other things that show the gear at the sea floor. Well, it sounds like you guys are making a lot of headway on not only meeting those challenges, but pushing through those challenges. And, you know, when you think about it, my God, what an incredible thing to, to you know, not entangle whales and kill whales and other marine, because people think of the whale entanglement, which is horrific. It's a long, slow death for those poor animals. And, you know, I mean, they basically starve to death in a lot of oca- uh, on a lot of occasions. But it's, all, it's other marine life, too. It's turtles. It's sharks. It's, it's all sorts of other things at, that I think that people might not think about when they're thinking about whale entanglement and, you know, ropeless um, fishing like this. But it's also, you know, brilliant for the fishermen because, you know, they can expand, you know, the lobster fishermen specifically can expand their territory. Once this is adopted, they can go deeper than they were able to go because you can only go so deep because of the line. And that's eliminated for them. They can actually go deeper uh, and, and extend their territory of fishing. And, you know, so there's the, the, the part of, you know, doing the right thing and saving marine life. And then there's the other part for the commercial fishermen, the lobstermen, where oh, it's going to expand their territory on top of all of that. So it sounds like, you know, two years down the line, you guys are meeting those challenges and pushing through them. And I know Teledyne, you know, they have a great support system too. And, you know, I know that they make great pains to make sure that they're supporting their products and assets and that that's a really important thing. Um, and it sounds like you have found working with them to be really key. Yeah, I love working with Teledyne. It's, um, they're an incredible company and they they have a, a, a large knowledge base of what we're trying to accomplish here. And, and, and then some, there's other, there's other things that we can do. You know, ship strike is another huge challenge to, to whales. And I believe the acoustic modems can also be helpful to mitigate ship strike because they're, they are an active technology that can be listening and reporting and recording and in giving data that we're all very hungry to get in the ocean. Um, and, and those are very important things that, 
the project that we're working on currently, it's called the Dire Directional Acoustic Transponder. And Smelts was the first group to install um, basically ropeless fishing acoustics, hydrophones, and tran transducers in the hull of a, a fishing vessel. And and wow. that we did that in February. And now we have a technology, this directional acoustic transponder that Teledyne basically made custom for us that actually gives elevation, a, a range, a direction, and a bearing on a chart of where that gear is subsea. And this is the first of its kind. We just began um, testing about four, about three weeks, three weeks ago now, it was four weeks ago. We, we went out with two fishing boats and we had multiple technologies and multiple gear. And we were able to differentiate between these two fishing boats, different types of gear, and, and plot it on a, a marine chart that um, this group Earth Ranger, the Allen Institute, has been helping us with managing all this information. And so it was the first time that we were able to physically remove that buoy, and, but still mark this gear in a way that could be very useful to a captain that could see it on a in, in either an app base on his laptop or his tablet. And ultimately what we're fighting very hard to push to do is move this technology into multifunction displays and ultimately the chart plotter. And that's huge too for um, ghost gear and for fishermen not losing their gear to begin with. You know, fishermen you lose their gear, it sits on the bottom and then other animals die because it's just sitting on the bottom. Plus that, that's expensive gear. So, and, you know, it's also highly valuable to prevent ghost gear. They get their gear back and it doesn't pollute and kill other things. Um, I mean, that's pretty remarkable. And, you know, as I mentioned, it sounds like you guys are, um, you know, really pushing through not only the, those challenges, but finding all these other uses and applications for it as well. We are. We we have a we have a unit that's called the, the whale recorder raft and that's a Teledyne unit that we have JASCO Applied Sciences hydrophone technology. And, and and I had this idea years back, almost at the beginning of all this, that for one, I wanted to stop fisheries being villainized. I want fishermen to be, you know, needed um, people in our society because they are so needed. They provide the protein for so many of us. And, and they spend a lot of time on the ocean. I was like, you know, if we could tap into their network and the understanding that they have, and, and reward them for it, I thought that maybe if we could turn fishermen into community scientists, we would gain an ally in this hard work that we're trying to do. And that's what we did. We started packaging hydrophones in the ropeless gear, and then the fishermen are, are capturing all the anthropogenic sounds, all the natural sounds, ultimately whale calls, and things that are going on in their fishery. So we're giving co-occurrence data information to, to where these men and women are actually fishing this gear, and they're fishing it ropelessly. That's amazing. So now your partnership with Teledyne and, you know, you guys have done so much together already to develop this, um, you know, I know your product, to develop your product, and now you're seeing all these different applications and all this really cool stuff you guys can do with it. So what's next? What, what are you doing next? What's the next big thing that you're going to be, you know, your eyes on the prize kind of thing? Yeah, the, the the continuing to push this marking conundrum because it's it is so complex. Marking the gear and putting it on a chart plotter, I, I believe, is the future of fisheries. I believe it's the future for many other technologies and sciences that the ocean has. I mean, you could imagine if a if a Slocum glider or a Gavia glider that Teledyne is building and has the same modem type capabilities, if that could actually all of a sudden talk to a ropeless fishing technology. That ropeless fishing technology is actually recovered on a couple day or a weekly basis. And that information that's stored in there tells the pilots that that, that gavia, which might vanish for three weeks or a month, not knowing where it is, all of a sudden reports to this ropeless fishing technology that it just went, went by. And so there's a lot of neat technologies that are going to continue to build. It's really the underwater internet of things or the ocean of things where we're starting to build a network in the ocean that could be very very reliable for 
the science and the fisheries work we're trying to do and, and really help with climatology study, weather forecasting, and then ultimately controlling robots and knowing where robots are that are you know basically helping our ocean and, and looking or listening for whales. And again, the ship strike mitigation ideas of being able to respond very quickly to captains that whales were just detected, you know, maybe put an extra watchman, maybe slow down, you know, and, and continue these technologies. But we're, we're in the middle of this this project for real, for, from our perspective. We, we feel that there's a lot more to do. We can build our gear better. We can, we can make it tougher, stronger. We really don't ever feel like it's just done. Um, we're expanding our projects, Alaska, Canada, Washington. I've had other countries reaching out to me, Australia. So we're starting to move this because, again, this, this problem of persistent vertical line entanglement to large whales and other species is a global problem. It's not just a regional North Atlantic right whale problem. And and ultimately, closures are what protect whales. When when governments close fisheries, that's what protects the whales. But we don't want fishermen to be locked out if a closure does occur. So we're going to continue to try to build tools for their toolbox that allow them to keep fishing. And maybe someday, maybe someday that they'll they'll recognize that this this is an okay way of doing it. And maybe even someday they might like it. Um we have had gear that's been run through and, and got dragged miles away, and we, re, we found it and recovered it. It's very similar to how you respond to a person burying, burying in an avalanche in snow. You, a transceiver, the, the person hopefully has a transceiver, and you can actually do these search patterns and these, these you know, acoustic calls out into the ocean, and all of a sudden you get a, you get a confirmation that that gear just talked back. And, and now something that would have been lost forever is is able to be recovered and, and it's those kinds of things that we're trying to understand better you know the the economists are like well this technology is very expensive and i said well you know it is very expensive but my house is very expensive too but after 22 years and i own it it's a very reasonable place for me to live so there's a lot of technologies that have high capital costs up front but over time the, as they mature they, they become very valuable to an operation. And I, and I really hope that that's what ropeless fishing does for the industry, that they start realizing this is a good old tractor. And after the 17th year of fishing and just giving it a tune up and putting some fresh batteries in, this thing is making money for the fisheries. That's great. And it sounds like in the, a short amount of time, in two years, a short amount of time, you've comp- accomplished a lot working with Teledyne and the gear. So that's pretty cool. The, the the big thing from us is we're just we're really proud that there's been a group of people from all different stakeholders that have been working together putting putting a lot of stuff aside because change is hard for all of us. I, I've been involved with change myself and 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 I understand how hard that is. And we never set out to harm fisheries. We we really want to build a tool for them that does work. And is reliable and responsible, and and maybe someday that, that, like I was saying, that they really they realize that this is not a bad this is not a bad thing. This is maybe a way that I can really keep going in a an efficient coexisting way with the things that live in the ocean, and and reduce bycatch by many many factors, which is really what we're trying to do here. We don't want to catch species that are not intended, and and that's. That's the bottom line for for the ropeless gear. We don't want to catch things that's not intended, and we want it to be a reliable solution for the industry, and then maybe show promise of reliability and long lasting. Um, something that you know the the industry really slowly adopts and and realizes, and then continue to invest from our society into these technologies. It comes down to money for everything that we develop in our in the world. And, and be able to have more financial support from, you know, the government and other in, investors and people that, you know, see that this ocean technology is important. Absolutely. So um, as I mentioned before, you know, it's amazing how much has been accomplished just in the last two years since you last spoke to Melissa on Marine Tech Talk. Why Teledyne? I'm just curious, why did you choose Teledyne? Again, for us in the very beginning of this, 
we we wanted a reliable technology that was well proven and and I know that if if our navy can trust Teledyne a little tiny nonprofit that's trying to build a technology for fisheries probably could trust them now whether I was ever going to be able to afford any of it I was curious about but I was I was I've been very fortunate to win the NOAA bycatch reduction engineering program grant which I I state in those grants for exactly this purchase this technology from Teledyne work with Teledyne in the development and Teledyne had never there's been a lot of development for Teledyne as well they they had never intended on their technology being used almost at a daily weekly rate most of their gear has always been set in the ocean it's recovered a year later maybe two years later and and their strategies for battery management and and how the board functions is a little bit different than what we would use for technology that's going to be used regularly so there's been a lot of neat development between our groups but Teledyne is just a very I grew up in Massachusetts I was born in Plymouth I've, I've known about Teledyne for a long time i, I Probably, I think back, I probably would have applied there as an engineer if I didn't leave Massachusetts and go west. Um, they were just, a, they were always a company that I had a lot of interest in. And they, they do neat things. They do many neat ocean-based machine and, and vehicle platforms that I, I have a lot of interest in. So it was a, it was a no-brainer. And I was very fortunate that um, Dan Shropshire at the very beginning, the VP, he he was he was very patient with me and he listened to what I had to say. And 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 I think some of the other engineers thought I was a little crazy at the time to, you know, think about using, you know, Teledyne modems to go fishing. But we've come a long way since then and, and Teledyne has been an incredible partner and we continue to push the boundaries of development. And I and I think the next few years we're gonna continue to explore and discover a bunch of new stuff. That's awesome. Uh, really, I mean, that's that's um, you're doing really cool work, Richard. Hats off to you, and and I hope that um, in the next two years we can come back and have another conversation, and then you'll be even further along. <laughs> yeah, no, that would be if, if every every year I can't believe I get to do this another year kind of thing. I'm I'm very thankful and very honored and very humbled that some people have been trusting us to to try to figure this out. Well, that's awesome, and. I just want to, you know, thank you so much, Richard, for checking back in and being on Marine Tech Talk again and letting us know where you are. And uh, yeah, and we'll we'll keep in touch and make sure that we're uh, following along. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Have a great one. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Marine Tech Talk podcast. For more information on smelts, please visit their website at www.smelts.org. If you have any questions or comments about this episode, you can email marinetechtalk at teledyne.com. If you like this podcast, please be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcast or wherever you are listening to the show. That way, you will never miss an episode. Thank you for listening, and we will see you again next time.